decision and had like two options and um, my thoughts won't really bring me any further and then I try to listen to my heart and it also doesn't know really a way to the answer because both options will have like the prospect of hurting a lot like either way I choose it will hurt so my heart doesn't know which one to choose so how can I find the way to a solution if there are two options if there are two paths then do not choose any of them when there would be the right path then there would be only one path the right path never comes as an alternative to something existing the alternative to that which is existing would always be related to that which is existing in some sense it would be an opposite of that which is existing a thing and its opposite are always in the same dimension in the same plane never say that i have to choose between a and b a and b are both in the same plane if one side of the coin is not good for you the other side too will not be good for you because with the other side will come the first side as well if a thing is not proper for you mind you its opposite too can not be proper for you shun both the options this is the fundamental law of duality the two sides of duality appear as opposites but are always together so if you choose either one you have also chosen the other one do not choose any of the ends do not say yes to any of these options the right decision is never a decision the right decision is a spontaneous happening whenever a decision is involved the decision would be a flawed one so if the mind is hesitating procrastinating it is good news let it procrastinate even more let the action not happen at all procrastination means there is no inner sureness so it is good when there is no inner sureness then the action does not deserve to happen keep postponing it and one day out of sheer necessity under the weight of existential circumstances action will happen on its own and most likely that action will correspond to neither of the options you are conceptualizing keep postponing don't act at all why must you act when you are not sure you have two proposals and you aren't sure about any of them would you be happy marrying either of them postpone <coughs> postpone and postponement is not an active thing postponement just means i'm not budging i'm not moving i'm not compelled to act the situation that is is better than any of these two options it's okay i'm here all right life is quite intelligent life knows how to decide on your behalf if you just have a little trust on life she will take all your decisions beautifully better decisions that then you and me can ever make just trust life with the decision making part hmm is that marvelous intelligence of life is that marvelous intelligence higher than your own personal intelligence do you believe that way yes then how do you explain it using your own intelligence <laughs> 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 
if you are asking me to explain then surely there is a hidden belief somewhere that your own personal intelligence is wide enough to accommodate the existential intelligence perhaps there is a metaphor or an image that the mind can be happy with okay it is called faith faith means do i do not quite know what it is yet i am fully sure that it is faith means though i do not quite know what its nature is but i am fully fully sure that it is good for me though i do not know what it is going to do next but i am fully sure that whatever happens irrespective of my reaction to it it is auspicious that is faith faith is trusting in the unknown hmm that existential intelligence is not a thing to be explained it is an existential lap where you can relax peacefully it is like the breast of the mother where you can just lapse into sleep you cannot explain it you can only leave yourself to it one uh, quotation from osho he said life is a mystery to be lived not a problem to be solved Hmm? Is it just a quotation, or is it to be lived? Yes, and faith is then something that breathes, something that has a heartbeat, just as you said. It is to be lived, not just talked about. Hmm? It is to be lived. are we together on this i don't want to lose anybody behind in the movement are we together the whole spiritual process can so easily become another pursuit of the ego it can just become more collected knowledge the only thing that distinguishes egocentric activity from self inquiry is faith hmm an ability to know without knowledge an ability to know without knowledge ha <sighs> what is that it is no ability it is blindness it is madness it is a kind of craziness but you must be capable of that craziness hmm it is not scary it is fun don't stare at me like that it relieves it is all right to be not in the driver seat sometimes
like this, haven't you had just before been through books for to be able to express all this? Or does your talk come from nowhere and you don't know anything? He talks about Buddha, he's just talking about us. You, you know what, what you are talking about, so you have to, you have been to yes. many talks before yes. being yes. able to. Yes. And that is giving me words. But none of that, none of the knowledge, none of the books that I have read is giving me the center from where I am speaking. Knowledge can give me an appropriate word, but knowledge cannot provide me with the center from where that word emanates. Maybe if I have read the scriptures, then I can come up with an appropriate quotation, a shlok, a sutra, a verse or a doha. But even if I were to have not read that, then it wouldn't make much of a difference. The center would still remain the same. Kindly do not think that you require a lot of knowledge to go into yourself. You already have a lot of knowledge and that knowledge is sufficient. Let me ask you a question. What knowledge did the first Upanishadic Rishi have? Had he read other Upanishads? Answer me. Yes. And if he could have it, then is it so impossible for you? Is it so impossible for you? Where was he getting all his understanding from? From nowhere, from life, from birds, from insects, from river, from the daily interactions, from man and woman, from the crying child, from jealousy, from attachment, from man's search for something sublime. This was available to him for observation. And is it not available to you for observation? Don't you think that if you walk on this street, not with all your beliefs, not with all your baggage, but with your eyes really open, then you know what the Upanishad is saying. Oh, you may not know the words. You may not know the shlok. But you have already known what the Upanishad is saying. And you know what is amusing about all this? Only when you have known the Upanishad by yourself, that and then the Upanishad of the Rishi becomes relevant to you. If you have not discovered your own inner Upanishad, then the Upanishad, the book in your hands, will not really speak to you. So the book means nothing. The book cannot give you anything if you have not already obtained it. In a sense, a book is just for a kind of verification. A book is just for joy. A book is just for resonance. Ah, the same, the same, yes, yes. In much better language, but same. So you, you read that shloka and you say, ah, I know, I know, yes, yes, you're right, man, yes. <laughs> I believe, yes. It is not as if you read it and you try to memorize it and then you say, now I know. How will you know from the words if you have not known from life? Ah, is that not a good question to ask? How will I know from somebody's words if I have not already known from life? So the scriptures or books of wisdom are there just to corroborate, just to support, just to validate, not to teach. There can be only one teacher, your own life, your consciousness, your living, your alive.
I'm not saying the scriptures have no value. I sincerely recommend them. I make it a point to even push my students to read them. But I also know that no scripture helps the one whose eye for honest observation is not open. I call them the two wings of spiritual flight. First, an honest observation of the world. Second, a deep faith in the words of the scripture and the guru. Both must exist together. And then you can fly. Hmm? Usually the second one is missing. In what way? Not in the way that the scripture is missing. The faith is missing. Huh? Practically, if the book says something and that something is not backed by your own experience, would you be able to deeply believe in what the book is saying? Tell me. If the book says something and that something is totally alien to you, would you still be able to believe in what the book is saying? Would you be? Huh? You can force yourself to believe. That's what man has already always been doing. Oh, it's a holy book. So whatever it is saying must be true. Let me believe. So the book is saying that angels descend from heavens and deliver babies. Now that must be true. And then you are just divided. And then what do you say? You say, spiritual life and spiritual books are different from worldly life and worldly books. So the books of medical science may say something about where babies come from. But the spiritual books are saying something else about babies. And both are true because I can't reject either of them. So both are true and both are separate. So let me make two compartments. One is the maternity ward of the hospital where babies are coming from and the other is the spiritual place where you have babies dropping from the sky huh no that compartmentalization is false break down the wall bring down the wall every movement of life is a spiritual movement you might be in your office. Hmm? You need not be wearing saffron. You need not be wearing a t-shirt with Om and Ganesha on it. Even if you are wearing a necktie, even if you are busy in a business transaction, still it is a spiritual movement. Do not take vacations to enter spirituality. Because if you take vacations, the vacations will end one day. And then what will begin again? What would again begin? Every vacation has a deadline. Don't take vacations. Let your life itself be a spiritual vacation. Just something spontaneously happen and uh, what is believing this is the question because what I realized uh, even in this world by itself it's be living but also wrote in a strange way and what is for you what does happening when somebody believes something what is believing believing is taking something as it is when you attach the prefix it is to anything you have believed in it so let's say does it mean that whatever thoughts are arising during the day there are all beliefs 
Yes, they are all beliefs. Mm -hmm. Be yeah. They are all beliefs. Mm -hmm. Whenever you say that something is, you have believed in it. Now the question is about the quality of the belief. Have you believed just because you have been told that it is? Or have you believed with the full power of your knowing? When belief is superficial, very very superficial, absolutely baseless, then it becomes superstition. When it has some basis, somebody told it to you, you read in some book, then you can call it a kind of trust. And when the belief is again totally baseless, arising directly from the heart, a totally foolish belief, then you call it faith. Faith is so much like superstition and yet totally different from it. How do you know that you love the right one? How do you know, sir? How do you know? How do you know? Can a machine prove it? Can a chart prove it? Can a method or a formula prove it? Can your past experience prove it? How do you justify your love for a lamb? We met a kitten an hour back and everybody was eager to hold it, to caress it. How do you know that it is the right action? Kitten starts. There are people here who hold piglets as well. It comes from the heart. It comes and springs from here. It just happens. It's felt. You would never really consciously know whether it is superstition or faith. And faith shaken would appear so much like a superstition. You would curse yourself. Whenever you find a reason to believe, you are in the safe zone. You are trusting some source. Hmm? The source could be a teacher, a book, an experience, anything. Faith is trusting without a base, without a reason, without a cause. Superstition is much the same. much the same. They look so alike. Very minor differences are there. Come on. Is nobody here interested in knowing what that minor difference is? <laughs> I keep dropping hints and... Okay, you're not interested. No, what, what is the difference? <laughs> difference between what and what? Faith and Superstition. superstition. I just don't know the superstition, but I was going to ask what is for you the difference between trust and faith. Superstition is always about something. Superstition always has a story attached to it. Superstition is always objective. With faith, there is no object and no story. You cannot say anything about faith. All you can say is, it is alright. All you can say is, it is good. Nice. Why nice? I do not know. How nice? I cannot explain. Who do you have so much faith on? On nobody. You are faithful towards, uh, well, nobody in particular. When you trust somebody, there is always somebody that you are trusting. When you have faith, then you are, there is nobody that you are trusting. Such is the deep trust. Huh? Trust says, don't worry. 
you will not be harmed faith says even if i am harmed it's all right trust says everything will happen as per your wish faith says my wish does not matter whatever happens even if it is against my wish i'm all right trust is always conditional faith is free not having any boundaries or conditions with it yes things can go bad see if you continue like this you will have to file for bankruptcy trust will say no that day will never come some money will arrive from somewhere and what would faith say even if even more than that even if i care it doesn't matter <laughs> it is not only about i don't care because sometimes you do care sometimes you are afraid aren't you yes sometimes you are shivering and trembling aren't you faith says even if i am appearing like an intimidated puppy right now yet everything is all right yes i am suffering yes i am crying yes there is blood oozing from my source <coughs> yet it is so cool i can still laugh at a joke i can still enjoy something silly ha huh? i will not get enraged i will not say so bad is my condition and you are playing a joke yeah a joke is always welcome even if five of my teeth are missing i would still smile ha <laughs> faith says good is good and bad is better than good good is good all right and if it is bad then it is equally good it's okay not that bad is good wait i am still feeling bad remember it is not that the mind is saying that everything is hunky dory no the mind is feeling bad the body is trembling and falling apart and yet there is something an untouched center which is at peace the eyes might be crying but there is something within which is totally undisturbed that is faith faith does not mean that you will walk around like some saint oh see the faithful one that is just a fanciful image you have to live in this world ha huh? and if you don't get food then you will feel bad the stomach will cry out if you are insulted humiliated slapped or wounded you will feel violated from the mind there would be a recoil in the middle of that disturbance in the middle of that mess and chaos still remain untouched let that be touched whose nature is to get touched whose nature is it to get touched if i come and touch you what is the maximum that i can touch your body so let the body be touched whose nature is it to feel hurt very often i let the mind feel hurt even when the mind is feeling totally hurt i'm still all right
Why? Why so? Nobody knows. I don't okay. care to know. I'm not even bothered about knowing. That is faith. Faith does not merely say I do not know. Because if you say I do not know, that means you do not yet know, but you would be. If you just say I don't know, that means now you would be trying to know. Or that you have kept the possibility of knowing in future open. You are saying I don't know. But it is not outside the province of knowledge. One day it might be known. Faith says, ha, who wants to know? Better things to do. Come on, bring on the kitten. <laughs> Why load yourself with spiritual questions? I am not accountable to divinity. Let God come He wants if He wants all these answers. Why must I read one of the holy books? I would rather read a book on how to raise kittens. Hmm? Learn to play with a cat. That is more spiritual than raising your legs and practicing breathing. If you don't know how to play with a rabbit, if you can't hug a tree, then it doesn't matter how you breathe. You don't have a heart. What will you do with all your breathing if your heart is not beating? Huh? You are on ventilator. Kittens are the key. That's the sutra. <laughs> Never forget it. The small things, the small things. That's where the big lies. And that's why the big is so easy to miss because we are accustomed to missing the small. We are not missing something which is shrouded, concealed, We are missing something which is present and apparent. We are not missing the secret. We are missing something which is so very obvious. Huh? And the obvious is very easy to miss when you are in search of a secret. The obvious is so easy to miss. Hmm? When you are looking for something that you have lost, one place where you would never look is the ground right under your feet. You would look here and there and everywhere, but never right under your feet. Maybe it is there. Maybe that's why it appears lost. Hmm? There is always ground under your feet, whether or not it is Rishikesh. You don't have to come to Rishikesh to search for ground. Ground is always there. If you are there, the ground is there. Do you know which ground I am talking of? That ground is also called the Atman. That is the ground of being. There is always ground under your feet. Look there, right there. Don't search here and there. And keep a kitten close by to remind you of this. Yes, yes. If the heart can beat, it can also speak. Let it speak. What 
Oh, you wanted something big? Huh? Something from the Upanishads? Something from the Yoga Sutras? <laughs> yes? Something from Ashtavakra or Dattatre? You don't like kittens? We have those texts here. Would you rather spend the evening reading them? I love kittens. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and piglets. <laughs> and piglets. And babies. And babies. And leaves. Ah. And rotten leaves as well. Why not? And beautiful young babies. And also stinking corpses. Huh? Huh? Don't forget them. Don't forget them. father bird flying and maybe it knows one day I will also fly and yet there's that security of the nest and there must be that moment when it gets a kick out of the nest and maybe that's a terror but never it starts to fly but left to its own devices it might never jump don't believe in special moments there are no special moments there is only the flow there is no special kick that the bird needs. It is a continuity. One day, the baby emerges from the womb. It is not a special moment. This moment was in the making since many months. If those months have been there, this moment too will be there. It is not special at all. It is a guaranteed moment. It is a part of those previous months. But if you believe in special moments, then you will pay no attention to all those months. You will believe as if something special, something unique, something different, something external is going to happen one fine day. In a way, you are hoping for divine intervention. Now, divine intervention is never special. It is continuous. Grace does not fall upon you one day. Grace is that ubiquitous ground under your feet. Grace is always there, always there. Ha! Huh. Sometimes you realize it and then you say, this moment is special. God has been so kind to me. God has always been kind to you. It is just that you are realizing it right now. There is nothing special here. Everything is so ordinary. Learn to live in the ordinary. If there is anything that is special, it is the ordinary that is special. Huh? Every fragment of time, every inch of space, all of it is special. Every single relationship, every breath that you take in, every heartbeat, all is special. You know, we make a grand mistake when we turn God into a special entity. Probably that is the first mistake mankind made. God was the first extraordinary imagination man had. Ah, the special one. God or truth is not special, here, there, everywhere, all around. By making him special, you send him away. 
by seeing him in the ordinary you embrace him you want to keep him in a special church or do you want to keep him right close to your heart in your kitchen in your bedroom in your bathroom in your garage in your playing field everywhere do not give him a special place no moment is special nothing special ever happens if you keep waiting for the special you will keep missing on life life is ordinary i know what your next question might be it would be on that special thing called enlightenment it is a myth you are already enlightened enlightenment is ordinariness just accept your enlightenment you don't have to be enlightened just as you need to accept all the small and meaningless and little things in life similarly you have to accept another little thing called enlightenment it is the littlest thing it is the most ordinary thing and it eludes us because we are searching for it in the grand in the ornamental in the heavens you won't find it there hmm you would rather find it where in the eyes of the kitten don't miss it there 